Okay. Well, hi. <laughs> Again, let me recap what you missed, if you did not hear me. I'm Kristen, hi. It's great to be here. Welcome to Asbury. We have three adult Sunday school classes, if you did not know that. And they are all different, and you are welcome at any of them. And they are located down in the admin wing of the church. So um, then they start right after the service at 10 o'clock. We also have Sunday school going on right now for middle and high school youth. And that happens upstairs in the Boy Scout room. Is that correct still? Awesome. Things change so quickly. Um, so, and we're hoping to have um, smaller children Sunday school back really soon. Oh, November 1st is when we're planning on doing that. So praying that that will, that will indeed come to pass. Uh, let's see. So I wanted to let you know that if you wanted to sing softly or hum along with the praise band in your mask, you are welcome to do that. Um, we're just trying to stay as safe as possible. And the praise band um, is amazing. And we're so thankful for their ministry to us and to God. So uh, it's hard not to sing along with them. So feel free to do with that. Um, do that as you wish. Trunk or treat. This is a tradition that we've been having here at Asbury. It's a very popular thing where we get to um, fellowship with lots of folks, and it's a great uh, thing for kids, families, parents. Uh, but because of COVID, uh, we are amending our trunk or treat. We're not canceling, we're amending. Uh, so here how, here's how it's going to go. It's going to be held on Sunday, October 25th. That's the last Sunday in October. It's going to be at 4 o'clock here in the south parking lot. Uh, there's going to be an awesome puppet show. You know, Puppets in Christ, they're really fantastic. So they're going to start us off at 4 o'clock in the parking lot. And um, the church is the only one that's going to be handing out candy to stay as safe as possible. So we are asking for donations for candy. If you would like to donate to um, Miss Heather. Miss Heather, raise your hand. Yep. Donate up. Candy um, for Miss Heather, and we're going to put some candy bags together for the kids. And also, if you'd like to decorate your car like we usually do, we usually have kids walk around and look at all the cars. Uh, we're still looking for folks to do that as well. So it's going to be held. We're excited about it. It's just going to be a little bit adapted um, to keep everyone safe. So uh, if you have any questions, you can talk to Miss Heather. She'll be able to tell you a lot more than I can about trunk or treat. So did I miss anything? We're good. Okay. All right. So let us take a deep breath together and let's um, be in a prayerful and worshipful attitude as we listen to the praise band. Laden and you hurt him. For all the 
of you with nothing left Come and find rest What if I, what if I were the one to tell you That the fight's already been won If I think your day's about to get better What if I were the one to tell you I think Fred's got it. Thanks, Fred. Appreciate your help. All I know how to do is turn it on and off. So, All right, let's continue, shall we? Would you please stand as you're able for the call to worship? This week we are in week 204 of our series, uh, Our Money Story. And we're really excited about this series, and we hope you are too. This week's theme is release. Release. So... Through Moses, God said, In Scripture, the law declares, In the seventh year, we must cancel all debts. With grace, Jesus said, With honesty, Jesus taught, Faith has always involved letting go, releasing, setting free, dropping our nets, giving to others, and following. So in this hour of worship, may we release our divine blessings. May we worship with open, unhaving, and forest hearts, so that we can walk free with God. Let it be so. Amen. Amen indeed. Join me in our opening prayer, please. Gracious God, we admit to holding tight to that which we know and understand. We put you in a box to avoid the shade of gray that come with faith. We put worship in a box to avoid the discomfort of change. We put ourselves in boxes labeled with gender expectations and societal norms. We put others in boxes labeled worthy and unworthy. We put all that we have in a box and pray we won't run out. So in this moment, we confess to holding tight to fear, greed, and worldly structures. Forgive us for missing the point. Open our eyes to a new way, to a holiness found in open boxes, unclenched fists, shades of gray, and holy release. Gratefully, we pray. Amen. Good morning. Can you hear me? Okay, good morning. God is good. All time. The first scripture this morning is Deuteronomy chapter 15, verses 1 to 11. At the end of every seven years, you must cancel debts. 
This is how it is to be done. Every creditor shall cancel any loan they have made to a fellow Israelite. They shall not require payment from anyone among their own people, because the Lord's time for canceling debts has been proclaimed. You may require payment from a foreigner, <clears throat> but you must cancel any debt your fellow Israelite owes you. However, there's no, there's need be no poor people among you. For in the land the Lord your God is giving you to possess as your inheritance, he will richly bless you. If only you fully obey the Lord your God and are careful to follow all these commands I am giving you today. For the Lord your God will bless you as he has promised, and you will lend to many nations but will borrow from none. You will rule over many nations, but none will rule over you. If anyone is poor among your fellow Israelites in any of the towns of the land, the Lord your God is giving you, do not be hard-hearted or tight-fisted toward them. Rather, be open-handed and freely lend them what they need. Be careful not to harbor this wicked thought. The seventh year, the year for canceling debts, is near, so that you do not show ill will toward the needy among your fellow Israelites and give them nothing. They may then appeal to the Lord against you, and you will be found guilty of sin. Give generously to them and do so without grudging heart. Then, because of this, the Lord your God will bless you in all your work and in everything you put your hand to. There will always be poor people in the land. Therefore, I command you to be open-handed toward your fellow Israelites who are poor and needy in your land. This is the word of the Lord. The next reading is 2 Corinthians 9, verses 6 to 15. Here is something to remember. The one who plants only a little will gather only a little, and the one who plants a lot will gather a lot. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give. You shouldn't give if you don't want to. You shouldn't give because you are forced to. God loves a cheerful getter, and God is able to shower all kinds of blessings on you. So in all things and at all times, you will have everything you need you will do more and more good works. It is written, they have spread their gifts around to poor people. Their good works continue forever. God supplies seed for the person who plants. He supplies bread for food. God will also supply and increase the amount of your seed. He will increase the result of your good works. You will be made rich in every way. Then you can always give freely. We will take your many gifts to the people who need them and they will give thanks to God. Your gifts meet the needs of the Lord's people, and that's not all. Your gifts also cause many people to thank God. You have shown yourselves to be worthy by what you have given, so other people will praise God because you obey him. That proves that you really believe the good news about Christ. They will also praise God because you share freely with them and with everyone else. Their hearts will be filled with love for you, when they pray for you. God has given you grace that is better than anything. Let us give thanks to God for his gift. It is so great that no one can tell how wonderful it really is. The Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Good morning. Woo! <laughs> Maybe if that's off. Okay. Good morning. Good to see everyone today. Sure. So um, how many of us, probably all of us, but has anybody ever given something away? Can you raise your hand if you've given something away? I know, we've all, we've all given something away. Um, for the kids, maybe it's mom says, let's clean your room. So you go in your room and you go through all your toys and all of your clothes and you, there's clothes that you've outgrown so maybe you hand them down to a, a cousin or a brother or sister. There's toys that mom knows you do not play with. So she says, let's donate them to somebody who can really use them. So maybe you give them to the op shop. Yes! <laughs> Please give them to the op shop. Or you give them to um, Halo Christian Shelter or something like that. So it's good to give things away. How does it make us feel when we give things away? Most of the time, I, if I give something away, I feel pretty good about that. I hope that whatever I have, have been able to give away helps someone who really needs it. Or maybe someone else gets to enjoy it for a little while. Have you ever given something away and you kind of go, oh, 
don't really want to get rid of that. I think kids do that. Yes, let's give, give Barbie away. I don't want Barbie. And then a week later, where's Barbie? <sighs> uh, giving away is hard. Release is hard. And not just, for, not just for kids, for all of us. So in our Bible lesson for today, um, this man goes to Jesus and he says, I just am not happy. I must be missing Jesus, I have everything I need. I have tons of money, great stuff. I'm following all your rules. Everything is great in my life. It's wonderful, but I'm not happy. What am I missing? And Jesus says, well, the problem is that you're not missing anything. You're not missing anything. You have too much stuff. You have way too much stuff. You know, and we do that. We like our stuff. Do you like your stuff? I like my stuff. Jesus wants us to release some of that. So when we release some stuff, not only the physical things, but, you know, worry and hurt and anger and all those things, release those things. You make room in your life for what's more important, right? So we're going to do a little exercise together. And um, not real exercise. I don't exercise. It's a little... <laughs> A little something. I remember this lady came into our school when I was in like elementary school and she made us do this and I thought she was crazy but so you know what it feels like to clench your fists right? We're gonna clench everything starting with toes all the way up to the top of our head. Don't let go of anything and until we get all the way to the top. So clench your toes, clench your feet and your legs and your, your middle and your shoulder and your fists and your face. I would love the kids to be up here so I could see their faces face in your head and hold it and then I'm going to count three two one and we're going to release three two one that's better right <gasps> gotta be better <laughs> to release all right let's say a prayer together God you have blessed us which so much in our lives help us remember Lord that you are enough we don't always need all this stuff Help us to let go of our fears and of our worry. Help us to make more room for you in our lives. In your name we pray. Amen. Walking the same old road miles and miles You've been hearing the same old voice Tell the same old lies If you're trying to fill the same old holes inside There's a better life There's a better life If you got pain He's a pain taker Lost. He's a way maker. If you need freedom or saving, He's a prison shaking Savior. If you got chains, He's a chain breaker. We've all searched for the light of day in the dead of night. We've all found ourselves worn out from the same old fight. We've all run to things we know just ain't right. There's a better life. There's a better life. We got pain. He's a pain taker. If you feel lost, he's a way maker. You need freedom or saving. He's the prison shaking savior. If you got chains, he's a chain breaker. If you believe it, if you receive it, if you can feel it, somebody.
already testified, testified. If you believe it, if you receive it, if you can feel it, somebody testify. gospel today is from Luke chapter 22 verses 1 to 23. Someone came to Jesus with this question, Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? Why ask me about what is good, Jesus replied. There's only one who is good. But to answer your question, if you want to receive eternal life, keep the commandments. Which ones, the man asked, and Jesus replied, You must not murder, you must not commit adultery, you must not steal, you must not testify falsely. Honor your father and mother, honor your, love your neighbor as yourself. I've obeyed all these commandments, the young man said. What else must I do? Jesus told him, If you want to be perfect, go and sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. But when the young man heard this, he went away sad, for he had many possessions. This is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. The congregation of Asbury Methodist Church continued to grow while meeting at the Old Red Meeting House in the early 1800s. A revival lasting two years began in 1823. One of the church leaders at that time was David Vance, an anti-slavery leader and temperance supporter, who is among those early church leaders remembered in a stained glass window in our sanctuary. He led a Monday night church class from 1823 to 1862. Tonight class, I would like to give consideration to the writings of the esteemed John Wesley on that issue which troubles us in our times, the enslavement of our fellow human beings. Wesley wrote, Give liberty to whom liberty is due, that is, to every child of man, to every partaker of human nature. Let none serve you but his own act and deed by his own voluntary action. Away with all whips, all chains, all compulsion. Be gentle towards all men and see that you in invariably do with everyone as you would he should do unto you. And now class, do we not live in times not too unfamiliar when these same transgressions occurred against God's children Israel, 
in the land of Egypt. And recall what our Lord commanded Pharaoh in the book of Exodus. Let my people go. By 1844, however, the creeping acceptance of slavery by many Methodists resulted in a slave-owning bishop, Bishop James Andrew, being installed by the National Conference, which in turn contributed directly to the division of the conference between the Methodist Episcopal Church South and the Methodist Episcopal Church North. Locally, despite the growing political tensions in the country, Asbury's congregation outgrew the old Red Meeting House. In 1852, a new larger white frame church with green shutters was built for the Asbury congregation on the same location as the previous church building. A main aisle separated its two sections of pews. On the left sat the men and on the right sat the women. The old Red Meeting House was dismantled and building materials were reused to construct a small house on this church property for educational and social purposes. However, even as the church was outgrowing its old building, so too was the growing social and political tension of that area on, the, on that era on the eve of the Civil War. Consider how a conversation between women church members of the time might have sounded. My heart aches for those who continue to support this terrible act of slavery throughout our country. Do they not know that in using another human against his will, they're offending our Lord? You should not agree so. I am good friends with the well-respected Horsey family here in Somerset County, and they are in great need of, of the labor of which you speak of. And I know for certain that many of their Negroes are quite content with a means being provided to them by that family. Indeed, all food, warmth, and care is provided to help ensure they never have to worry about any of life's needs, as you and I must worry in caring for ourselves. I do not believe this is how our Lord God would want us to provide support for our fellow man. By binding them in chains, and whipping them as some owners do in order to care for them. Surely you must know Lord Jesus came to the world in order to break the chains that bind us to sin. Not to justify an inhumane practice of keeping people in bondage. The same bondage that was used in ancient times in order to hurt God's children Israel. No. No. I pray that you reconsider your recommendation of this terrible system. Yes, our sister has spoken true, and I believe that she is really speaking the Lord's will for all of us. I believe it is the great hope of this generation in this American people that we put an end and into this terrible treatment of our fellow man, once and for all. I fear what you speak of can only be achieved at great human cost, for such a change will have to be against the will of many in our community and in our nation. Be careful for that which you hope to see. Good day to you all. The bloodshed predicted by the member did indeed come to pass. Some estimates are that up to 70% of Eastern Shore residents were Southern sympathizers, despite Maryland remaining in the Union. For four years, tens of thousands of Americans died in fighting the Civil War. In 1866, despite the Civil War having recently ended, the bitter sectional tensions between Northern and Southern sympathizers remained, including between families. Although slavery was dead, new issues arose that inspired sectional division across the nation and locally, such as reconstruction plans and whether the federal government should stop printing money not backed by gold, known as greenbacks, which it had done to finance the war, or to return to the gold standard. At Asbury, that post-war tension came to a boil when many Southern sympathizing members of Asbury's congregation, about 70% of the congregation, left 
They left the church to form a new church affiliated with the Methodist Episcopal Church South. One must wonder what the prayers of church leaders were of the time. My dear husband, what will become of our church if so many choose to leave us? I fear for our church and for our future. Wife, pray with me. Let us ask the Lord to show us the way. Yes. Father, Father, we desperately need your help to save our church. When I was asked to serve member for Asbury, I knew our members shared the bitter division of these times. And indeed, although the guns have stopped, the fighting sadly continues. Why, God? Why? Why must it be this way? Why, even in our own church here, we have one family, two brothers, that are bitter with each other. One brother, Elihu Jackson, well, he is among the leaders of those who have chosen to separate from Asbury. They have formed a new church just across the street from us. They call Trinity Methodist Church. Meanwhile, Father, his own brother, William Jackson, he remains with us in support of Asbury's future. Why, why, Father, why should it matter that, that one who left us has to be a Southern Democrat, supports keeping greenbacks and that helps his financial interest, while the other is a Republican and wants a return to gold? Why? Why does politics or, or regional loyalty or, or economics even have to separate your people? How, Father? How, how can we heal our own wounds as a people when even within their own families, people have all this fighting that's led to our church congregation splitting apart? Father, may you please show us the way forward and bring healing to our church and to our country. Father, I ask these things in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Their reasons may have been many and were surely deeply felt. But there is no doubt that Asbury felt the loss of those many members who left. Friendships were damaged, families separated, and feelings were no doubt hurt. But the Lord provided an answer to the many prayers of Asbury's leaders. For it was not long after Asbury's congregational split that Asbury held a number of revival events focused on teaching God's word that helped to rebuild the congregation. It would be another 20 years before Asbury and indeed the entire Salisbury community would have to overcome yet another great obstacle in its history. For now, however, in the midst of healing and from the schism of the congregation, we conclude our bittersweet second chapter of Methodism here at Asbury. Amen. Amen. Certainly, uh, again, a very, very effective way of helping to share the story. Thank you, all of you, for uh, that hard and generous work that you have given us uh, as we think about our own past, our own present, and our own future. Let us pray. Gracious God, we release our hearts to you. First, we remove the pressure. A release requires the freedom to move. Then we allow our hearts to return to their original resting position in sync with you, with the rhythm of autumn days in this whole wild creation. And we pray that you will find our hearts available not just physically but emotionally and spiritually. So like the mockingbird releases her song, we release our hearts to you. Move in them, stir us awake, speak to us now. We are waiting. Amen. In the scripture we heard today, Jesus meets someone with a very simple question. Scripture describes that person as a young man. That's all we know from this, uh, this passage that we read today. There are other versions, obviously, in different Gospels that give us 
more information. That simple question is, what good deed must I do to inherit eternal life? Straightforward, reasonable. It's what many of us would ask Jesus if Jesus were standing here before us. And amazingly enough, after pointing out that God alone is good, Jesus tells the young man to go and keep the commandments. The man rejoices. He has done this. He has done all that Jesus asks. And then Jesus says, if you want to be perfect, go and sell all your possessions, give the money to the poor, and then come follow me. The young man goes away sad because he has many possessions. It's a story that is familiar with many of us. We've wrestled with it in some way, shape, or form, probably over the course of our own journey. The young man, as the scriptures describe him, asks a question with a central theme, and that is, it is a transactional question, right? What must I do to inherit eternal life? If I do A, then I receive B. It's about the transaction. That's what this man is trying to understand. Jesus gives him, in response, a transactional answer. Go and follow the commandments and give away all that you have. And the man evaluates this request, this prompting from Christ, with what I would call a consumer mentality, right? He weighs what he has versus what he might get. He thinks about the assets and the opportunity cost and comfort and control. And he weighs all of that together and decides it is not worth it. The best move for him is to go away sad and retain all that he has. Jesus is inviting this man to go beyond. To go beyond the transactional. To go beyond the economics that makes sense. And Jesus invites him to let go of the situation and live beyond the transaction. Loving God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, and all your strength. And loving your neighbor as yourself. Or to follow Jesus' example, loving one another the way that Jesus first loved us means moving beyond the transaction. God loves us beyond that transaction, right? Because when we fail as individuals, God seeks to redeem us. God seeks to forgive us. And God is always there when we call out to God. But for most of us, that is the way that we experience Christianity, that we've come to learn that that the way that the Christian life works. We have reduced it to a transaction. It's personal faith and individual morality. And if we live by those calls, that creed, that understanding, then Christ is there to welcome us into the kingdom. If we intellectually assent to the idea of Christ, we are saved. If we make bad choices, we sin. If we do good deeds, we earn credit of some kind towards heaven. That's not really defined. Ultimately, we will be judged and found worthy, Matthew 25 tells us. And if we have done or put our faith in Christ, then we are counted amongst the sheep and the goats are sent off to eternal banishment. This passage and these passages that we have heard in the reading today move us beyond the transactional. A life lived in Christ is not focused on whether we're getting our ticket punched to go on to life eternal. It is about pleasing God and loving neighbor regardless of what we might get out of it. We let go of the transaction. We release it. We worry about love and care for God and neighbor. This is a call that Christ has for us. 
And when we live into it, when we embrace it wholly, it allows us to do a number of things. It allows us to let go of control and security to make sure that others have what they need and are a full part of the community. Our faith has always been about more than simply us. It is about us and neighbor and community. This is the ultimate release. And Jesus understood that. This answer that he gives the young man harkens back to the passage from Deuteronomy that Beth read for us earlier. The end of seven years, you must cancel all debts. Wow. I don't know about you, but if I look at this strictly logically and according to good and systemic thinking, this is a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad economic system. It is an awful way to run the world. It makes no sense. It doesn't work in the system that we've created. And it didn't work back then because there's no evidence that Israel ever did this. But this is the call. It's right there in that first verse at the end of seven years, you are to cancel all debts. Simple, plain, clear. Right straight out of the Torah. God commands it. And Israel eh, couldn't figure out how to make it work. But the invitation is there, isn't it? To step beyond our thinking and embrace a situation and circumstance that is different, that is not transactional, that is open to what God might have for us. In 1866, as we heard about in the drama, Asbury split. 70%, that's almost three out of every four people, got up and walked across the street and started a new congregation. That's why Asbury and Trinity are so close together. That had to have been an amazingly difficult time for a whole host of reasons. I can't even begin to imagine what it would have been like to live through the 1860s in this country. Civil war, people dying, people fighting. And then after what seems like an end to the hostilities, the church goes and splits anyways. For Asbury to continue that 30% remnant that was left over after the split, those folks had to release the idea that those 70 were ever coming back. They had to let go of that. They let go of the fact that not only did they leave, but transactionally they took their tithes and offerings with them. What is the church to do? And you heard... Outreach, revival, focus on the community, to invite people into a fellowship with Christ, to get back to living into the call of Jesus on our lives, to be Jesus' hands and feet in a real and loving way. And probably the hardest thing in all of that, right, is that that 70% across the street didn't leave the community. They just moved across the street. That 30% that was left had to find a way to work with that other group to ultimately let go of the animosity and the anger that would come from anything like that and to forgive. Forgiveness is the ultimate release because it frees you from the change that you've used to bind yourself. Whether you forgive somebody or not, they may never know. It's not going to probably make a difference in their life one way or the other, but it makes a difference in our lives when we forgive. Forgive is a, forgiveness is about release, and it is not an easy thing to do, is it? The congregation literally had to learn to love their neighbors right across the street, even though they felt betrayed or injured by them and what they had done. Two brothers had to figure out how to be in the same family even though they found themselves on opposite sides of that divide. We are called to do exactly the same thing. 
think for a moment about the modern parallels to this part of our shared history. That we are experiencing afresh again in the midst of pandemic. The politics of today are every bit as ugly as they would have been in 1866. Just like in 1866, there is more at work right now in a life of faith than simply a personal relationship with Jesus and individual morality. We are called to care about one another, to love regardless, and to be the hands and feet of Jesus because that's what we're to be. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. That's the commandments that Jesus gives us. But what does the future hold for us as a congregation, for us as a country, for us as a community? I have no idea. And my guess is, is that you probably don't either. I'm here to tell you that's okay. That's all right. Let it be that way. What we've got is way better than that. We've got something that goes much deeper, that holds us much closer, that calls us to something much deeper, and that is a love and a faith in Jesus Christ. And if we embrace that, let go of the transactions, release all of the stuff that gets in the way, we can do amazing things. And we will do amazing things Many of you have probably seen exactly the same thing that I have. When we hold on to that, when we seek to control what we think God wants, when we seek to put God in a box or the way that we live in a box, how often do we cause harm to ourselves and others in the midst of that holding on for control? All that does between where we are and where God wants us to be and what is that separation between us and God that's sin that's the definition it's not simply this understanding of personal morality it is really us not being where God wants us to be I'm sure our predecessors had to rethink everything about the situations that they had been through in the 1860s that caused them to reevaluate and reform and move forward together in a brand new way because they had to let go of that past and forgive one another in order to take the next step forward. So it boils down to that one simple question, are you willing to give away all that you have to build up treasure in heaven? tough question. I can tell you this. Release is important. We do need to let go. We do need release. We need to release what is holding us back from taking the next step forward. We need to release. We need release to help us take the next step forward. We need release from the idea that we are always right. We need release from control that our money exerts over us. We need release from the anger that we feel towards our brothers and sisters when they think differently than we do. We need release from fear and anxiety that grips us as a congregation, as a community, and as a nation. It's when we let go of that knowing that crazy things may happen and that life moving forward will not be perfect. We open ourselves to the work of the Holy Spirit and the adventure that Jesus calls us to. Look at the lives of the 12 that followed Jesus or the work of the early church in the book of Acts. They didn't know what was coming next either, but they were willing to trust that God was with them and that God had a plan, and that God would be there 
as they move forward out into the world to invite others into this deep, abiding relationship that allows some release over what holds us back. We need to open ourselves to the work of the Holy Spirit in our midst. We need to release and be the people that God calls us to be. Amen. I'm going to invite you to stand as you are able. We're going to share together an affirmation of faith. It's found in your worship booklet there on page four, about a quarter of the way down. We're just going to read this together. So let us do this in an attitude of prayer. We believe that on the first day, God released love and creativity over a void, and that void became mountains and rivers, sunsets and starry nights. We believe God released God's people from the grips of slavery, liberating us day in and day out. We believe God laid down with death and was released from its grip, knowing suffering and freeing us from this fragile life. And we believe God invites us day in and day out to release our fears, let go of assumptions, tear down walls, throw open doors, and walk closer to love. May it be so. Let's now enter into a time of prayer. Pray for the coronavirus pandemic and all its ramifications. We pray for a cure and for a vaccine. Pray for our nation to come together amidst all the tensions in this election time. Remember all the prayer concerns on our prayer list in the bulletin. Pray for victims of natural disasters around our world. Pray for aid workers and missionaries who are serving across the globe. Pray for all military, past and present. Pray for those who face war, terrorism, oppression, and violence. Pray for those incarcerated and their families. Pray for those being treated for cancer and other chronic diseases. Pray for all who are ill and in need of healing, all who are weary. Pray for those who are lonely and isolated during this time. Pray for caregivers and for all who are struggling. Pray for the homeless and all economically disadvantaged persons in our community. Pray for those who grieve, including the family of Linda King. Pray for the leaders of the church, local and state government, as well as world leaders. Are there other prayers that you would lift up at this time? Um, I ask that you pray for um, a daughter of a co-worker. Um, her daughter is having a baby this Friday, but the baby is being born with a cleft lip and palate, and they're very anxious, um, very concerned about feeding the child and what that's going to be to their normal life. So um, the Mills family, so thank you. Prayers that we get through this week of preparation because Carrie, my youngest, is getting married in the church next Saturday. I'd like to ask for prayers for my sister who is going through some pretty extensive chemo and radiation for cancer. I would last <clears throat> like to ask for prayers for our grandson who will be leaving tomorrow for service in the Coast Guard. So 
I know some of you may know, but we have a joy. Uh, Katie is due to have, she found out, a baby girl um, in February. So we'll have our second granddaughter. Let's continue in prayer. Lord, we do thank you for the day. We thank you for the opportunity to gather in worship. Lord, we pray for faith. We pray that you give us the faith to release, the faith to let go of our need to control. As we look back at those 19th century Asbarians, how hard it must have been to live through that time of schism, but, but now... In hindsight, we can see what you made of that, Lord. You, you made two beacons in this community for Christ. We pray that as we live through our own times, you would give us the faith to realize that you are working on something wonderful and we cannot see the end of the road. Let us just be faithful. And when we err, let us err in love. Lord, we lift this up to you as together we pray the prayer taught to us by your Son, Jesus Christ, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, now we have the opportunity to practice some release, to practice that through our giving, to let go of some of that that we hold on to, and to give it to God to use. So let us pray over the offering that we are about to collect. Holy God, it is not always easy to give what we have. We count pennies, we weigh the pros and cons, we calculate what we have given before and we remind ourselves of what we are giving now. We all have our money stories. And yet, even though it can take work for us to practice release, we trust that you can take these gifts, however freely or reluctantly given, and use them to build a more beautiful world. That is who you are. You are forever building castles out of sand, disciples out of people, and new life out of cautious gifts. We believe Help our unbelief. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Yeah, as the praise team plays, feel free to come and to release. in my mind that say I'm not enough Every single lie that tells me I will never measure up Am I more than just the sum of every heart again just who I am because I need to know Oh, you say I am 
think of me. In you I find my worth, in you I find my identity. Let us say together our ascending forth as we prepare to go. Go into the world showing a gentle attitude towards everyone. Be joyful and thankful. Fill your mind with those things that are good and deserve praise. Things true, noble, right, pure, lovely, and honorable. Put into practice what you have heard here. And may the God who gives peace be with each of you. We go in the peace of Christ to love and serve all creation. Go in peace, everyone. <laughs>